Will Wilson. I'm one of the park rangers here. Uh, those out. And uh, ironically enough, uh, Tim here uh, decided that the New Yorker was best suited to deliver the uh, session on topography and geography, neglecting the fact that he got native Mississippian on staff. That is from the very region that this area involves. Uh, so we are this evening going to, in fact, uh, revisit a little bit of the topography uh, and the geography area uh, of Vicksburg uh, because it does play a very crucial role in the fortifications that are constructed here uh, by the Confederate Army. Uh, Vicksburg is, in fact, already a fortress cause of its location. It is located on a hairpin turn uh, in the Mississippi River, uh, resting on bluffs some 250 feet uh, above the Mississippi. The topography that we're going to look at are two parts. Uh, the Mississippi Yazoo Delta, this area here, and then the lowest hills, the lowest bluffs. Uh, <coughs> the Mississippi Delta, which is the area in green, is some four and a half million acres. It is uh, 200 miles long by 85 miles wide uh, at its widest. Uh, for those that Are you what? I thought it was, but now I am. <laughs> now you're in surround sound. Now you're in surround sound. Very good. Um, for those of us that are from Mississippi, one of the key points that is made oftentimes is that the Delta starts at the lobby of the Peabody Hotel and ends at Catfish Row at Vicksburg, Mississippi. The uh, area that is known as the Mississippi Delta isn't, in fact, of course, a the official definition of a delta is, is a, an alluvial plain. Uh, and during the time of the Civil War, it acted as a defense for Vicksburg. Uh, the Yazoo River Basin, uh, it is Mississippi's largest basin, and drains about 13,000 square miles. Uh, and it actually covers about 30 counties of present-day Mississippi. This is the Yazoo River Basin, the darker blue, is the Yazoo River. It has its confluence at Greenwood, Mississippi, where the Tallahatchie River and the Alabusha River uh, can join. Uh, the Yazoo River forming there and, and then flowing south uh, past Yazoo City until it reaches the Mississippi River. All of the light blue uh, rivers and streams are uh, other rivers that drain this entire region uh, as well as even East Mississippi because it is all flowing towards the Mississippi River which you did see on Tim's slide. So you did have the Tallahatchie, the Yalabusha, the Big Sunflower River and it has several tributaries joining it. You would have had uh, Deer Creek which is also used in some of the Bayou campaigns in 1862. I believe Jake's going to get into some of that. And Steel Bayou, of course, the Steel Bayou campaign, which uh, is, an, is an effort to try and get around Vicksburg and come in from behind. In the mid-19th century, though, the Yazoo Mississippi Delta is not the region of the agricultural producing region of the state of Mississippi uh, like we know it today. It is, in fact, a hardwood swamp with cypress and sweet gum. Uh, the interior of the Mississippi Delta is still uh, almost impenetrable. So there are no railroads, very few roads, and what settlements there are, only about eight to 10, uh, reside on the rivers, like the Big Sunflower and, the, and Steel Bayou and such. So this area is in fact another defense to Vicksburg. We're not going to talk about the lowest hills. Uh, some, people, some people call them the lowest bluffs. These, uh, 
as Tim mentioned, are a windblown sediment uh, type soil that uh, date to the prehistoric times when uh, the glaciers melted. As those glaciers were treated out of the Midwest, that lowest soil is deposited and it's brought down the rivers and then a windstorm picks it up, blows it against uh, the east side of the Mississippi River, creating the lowest bluffs. And this is, in fact, what makes Vicksburg so defensible. It is these narrow ridges uh, and deep, steep ravines that you will certainly see in the park that made Vicksburg uh, a, a fortress uh, unlike any that military engineers had seen before. The Confederate rear line of defense is what is referred to when we are, are talking about the Confederate defensive positions that were placed to the east of the city, uh, some two miles out from the city center, along a ridge line that uh, would have stretched uh, from the north of the city to the south of the city. We would have also, of course, had river batteries in place uh, along <coughs> strategic points uh, protecting the river. It is a system of redoubts, redans, lunettes, field works, uh, connecting them by rifle pits so as to give a continuous line of defense. Uh, this is a quote uh, by Major Samuel Lockett, who is the chief engineer, and we'll get to him in just a second. There are nine major fortifications guarding access points into the city. It's what we would call a rapid avenue of approach today as a, as a military term. Uh, all of the roads, the uh, railroad, uh, Fort Garrett, uh, guarding a little valley that kind of swoops into the south part of the city, all of these fortifications are then going to be connected by uh, rifle trenches. So you had Fort Hill, and that's going to be our tour stop nine in the park. It's going to anchor the left flank of the Confederate defensive line. You had the Stockade Redan complex, and we it is referred to as Stockade Redan, but it was more of a complex than just one particular Redan. There were three major fortifications guarding the Graveyard Road into the city of Vicksburg, called the Graveyard Road because it comes right beside the city cemetery. Third, Louisiana Redan, guarding the north part of the Jackson Road entrance into the city. Called that because the third Louisiana infantry is positioned in this fortification. The Great Redoubt, positions to the south of the Jackson Road, uh, and in it you had the 21st and 22nd Louisiana. Uh, one of the things to note is that there was one Captain uh, David H. Todd of the 21st Louisiana at that location. You might not know David H. Todd, but I'm sure you've heard of his sister, Mary Todd Lincoln. Now, uh, the Second Texas Lunette, uh, just behind us here, where the Jewish Cemetery is located today, uh, was guarding the Baldwin Ferry Road into the entrance into the city. I called that because of the Second Texas Infantry positioned in in that fortification. Uh, just across from it, the Railroad Redoubt guarding the railroad cut. Last thing you would want. Grant to be able to do is just march right down the railroad and into the city. So the fortification was built guarding uh, that location. Fort Garrett, uh, again guarding a little valley that kind of swoops into the south part of the city. You know, any type of egress that is easily obtained, you want to make sure that there is a defensive position there. It is called Fort Garrett. Uh, because Colonel Isham W. Garrett, uh, Colonel of the 20th Alabama, who assumes command of, of uh, General, Brigadier General Edward D. Tracy's brigade after Tracy is killed at the Battle of Port Gibson, on uh, May 20, excuse me, May 17th, 
right here at uh, Fort Garrett. Uh, Ditchin W. Garrett it gets tired of all of the sharpshooters that are taking shots uh, at his men, so he decides to pick up a rifle and uh, take a shot back when he gets one in the chest and is killed. Uh, just a few days later, he does get the uh, notice that he has been promoted to Brigadier General, and in his honor then the fortification is named uh, for him. Before that, it was known as Square Fort, and you will see why in, in just a moment. You also had the Salient Work, which was right here. It was guarding the Halls Ferry Road entrance into the city. And South Fort, which is right here. And then uh, South Fort anchors the right flank of the Confederate line. Major Samuel Lockett graduates second in his class uh, from the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he is the chief engineer here uh, for the Confederate uh, defenses. Uh, he did rise to the rank of colonel uh, and to chief engineer of Army of the Tennessee. Uh, after the war, he did uh, teach at Louisiana State University and at the uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, Lockett also serves as principal assistant engineer in the construction of the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. Lockett would spend months reconnoitering and surveying and studying the terrain uh, that was given to him. And he is quoted as saying, the complicated and irregular site to be fortified, no greater topographical puzzle was ever presented to a military engineer. This is a fortification of uh, Stockade Redan, uh, which we do see today. We've been talking about these fortifications, Redans, Redoubts, and Lunettes. Well, what are they? Uh, this is one question that we always answer. Um, the, for, the handout that uh, we got this evening uh, gives a, good, a little bit of explanation about each one and also how these <clears throat> fortifications would have been constructed. A redan. Uh, it's French for projection or salient. Uh, you can see it's basically an upside down V with that apex pointing out. It's going to be pointing out towards your enemy. <coughs> what it's going to do is it's going to be able to allow you to cross your fire. If you have a straight line of defenses, all you can do is just shoot straight ahead. Once you put a redan, one of these angles in your defenses, you can now cross your fire at any incoming uh, enemy. Lunette, French, uh, which is a diminutive of loon, which is French for moon, and therefore that term lunette. Uh, again, a open area in the rear, <clears throat> much like a uh, redan. The lunette is going to give you much of the same concept behind the redan where you can cross your fire. You are just getting a little bit more coverage uh, with the lunette and, and it's oftentimes more of a crescent shape <clears throat> than this diagram here. Redoubt is uh, French for refuge and it was a square type fortification with an opening to the rear, this allowed for your uh, men to actually get reinforcements, to get resupplied, uh, while still being protected on three sides. The profile of these fortifications looks something like this. Uh, the exterior slope uh, you see here uh, would have been in front of it a ditch about eight feet wide and you're looking at anywhere from 17 to 26 feet from the, basically the bottom of the ditch to the top of the parapet wall. Uh, you would have had a firing step that allowed uh, soldiers to lean over the parapet wall to uh, place fire. The terraplane was often floored uh, for artillery and the artillery is going to fire through 
a hole in the fortification called an embrasure. This was a, a diorama in the uh, Missouri State Historical Museum. Uh, thanks to Jake for finding that. It's a really neat uh, diorama. This particular one showcases uh, the Stockade Redan complex. This perhaps is the Stockade Redan or Green's Redan off to the uh, right of the Stockade Redan. You can see the floors that would have been laid down for firing artillery. Here is the embrasure. The logs that you see would have been cut uh, first by the uh, Confederate <coughs> soldiers. They began constructing these fortifications in the fall of 1862. Uh, what trees were on the battlefield that had not been cut by settlers and such for uh, cultivating crops and grazing livestock, these soldiers are going to go out and cut them down. You are going to want a clear field of fire, and of course you can use those logs to help build your fortification. And there are uh, three purposes of field fortification. The first one is, of course, to provide protection against incoming fire. You are going to want to be able to uh, have yourself in a place that you are less likely going to receive uh, wounds from enemy fire. And so these fortifications do provide that. The second is also you're going to place obstacles in front of the path of any of these oncoming enemy uh, troops so that they will be unable to get very close to your position. You want to slow them up, uh, allow for you to be able to fire at their location, uh, and if they're not advancing at a rapid pace and they're just held up, slow moving, you've got an easy target. And three is to provide a clear field of fire some 50 to 100 yards wide and at least 300 to 400 yards in length uh, in which the defenders could fire uh, upon the attackers. And what this is going to do is, the, you know, the last thing that you want is for somebody uh, that is attacking your position to have a, a place of refuge themselves. So if they can hide behind trees, then they are certainly going to do that. As well, you, you see that if you have uh, just 50, 25, 50 yards of cleared area, beyond that is a, a row of trees, well, your enemy can mass in those trees, hiding their numbers, uh, offering protection, and thus making it harder for you to detect uh, how many there are and, and their oncoming uh, positions towards you. Fortifications would have had reinforcements. Uh, this is not a basket, <laughs> although uh, it, it does have a name, and it's gabion, which is actually French for basket. Uh, it is a cylindrical uh, basket open at both ends. It's not going to. It's going to be open here and open down at the bottom. It will be filled with dirt, and it can be used as a revetment uh, to form parapets on the trenches. And we'll show you. This photograph here. These are gabions. And then what we see right here are the fascines. Fascines are tightly bound bundles of wood. You basically would have gone out and cut down small trees and taken the limbs and branches off of taller trees, bundled them together, tied them up, and that's going to give you uh, a place to place these gabions on top of building you an additional wall, if you will, uh, more, more protection from incoming artillery fire, and again, it's going to help uh, fortify your own position. I just saw some photographs of the, uh, in the news, of course, the, all the stuff going on in uh, the Crimea area with Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, the, the Crimean War, of course, is 1851-1856, and you see a lot of uh, this type of stuff, even in that in that war as well. You would have also placed obstacles in front of your fortification. Uh, obstacles again are going to slow your uh, the enemy's advancement towards your position. 
This row of sticks you see here are called palisades. Uh, it is uh, French from impaling, basically. Uh, any number of uh, pales or stakes pointed at the top, so they are going to be all sharpened uh, here at the top, uh, set in the ground uh, in a row of others to form a defense uh, to your position. Enemy soldier attacking this location here has to come through this uh, before he can get to here. Anybody know what this is? Abati. That's correct. Uh, French from abatre or to fell. Uh, it's an obstacle formed basically when you sharpen limbs or branches into points. You're going to stack them all in a big pile. Sometimes these abati are anywhere from four to five feet thick and anywhere from six, uh, five to six feet high, uh, depending on what was available. And so, of course, the Confederate soldiers would have what trees they did cut down. Uh, they're not just going to burn that scrap wood. They are making these abati. And these are going to be in those deep ravines. So as uh, Grant's army makes these assaults on May 19th, on May 22nd, they are going to have to go through these. And at some points, they do leave gaps in these abati, making it a... Uh, firing field so they can concentrate their fire at that one gap uh, because if you see a gap you're going to try to run through it. Well, uh, it, it offered the Confederate soldiers a clear line to that gap and of course uh, caused the federal soldiers to th rethink their efforts. Shibota Free uh, Shavota Free actually date to Middle e, uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, they would have been placed in front of castles and such. Um, it was a log that had been uh, had holes drilled in it, and then smaller branches that had also been sharpened at the top into points, uh, placed in front of your defensive position, and it is uh, literally, uh, Chevaux is French for horse, and De Free is the free land, which was where uh, we see uh, in the Netherlands today, these uh, Frisians would have been trying to attack uh, places in France, and so these actually were invented, and we, today they still even call them Chevaux de Free. They even date, uh, you even see them in World War II, if you look at ever uh, pictures of Normandy, all of those iron jacks that are on the beaches of Normandy, those are Chevaux de Free. They're not made out of logs and sticks, but made out of iron. Uh, they're not stopping horses, they're trying to stop tanks. So you can see the progression of military type uh, uh, earthworks even into the 20th century. This is a painting of Thayer's Approach, that's our tour stop number six along the tour road. It was uh, painted by a soldier that was here uh, just a little while after the war, but you see the soldiers here, these Union soldiers that are making uh, gabions and uh, fascines. The tunnel that was reaching up here in the Confederate lines, uh, when you drive out to Tour stop six, you know, you see that this area is, is clear. You've got a ridge on your left, a ridge on your right. Uh, those are the sharpshooter lines that we see. And the tunnel that was dug, even though you've got the one, of course, under the, under the tour road, they did do this as well, trying to dig their approach to uh, the top of the Confederate lines there, uh, where the 26th Louisiana is positioned. The you're basically digging a ditch, but what they're doing is they're putting these fascines over the top so that the Confederates cannot just shoot down into their, uh, into their approach trench. Uh, of course, Vicksburg is on the Mississippi River. That's why it makes it so uh, vital, such a strategic location. 
But again, the thing to remember is that at this time in 1863, Memphis is under Union control. Baton Rouge is under Union control. New Orleans is under Union control. All three of those cities do have a railhead. Of course, now that they are under Union control, no supplies from the uh, states of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas uh, can get across the river. Vicksburg is still the only Confederate-held railhead uh, holding the two halves of the Confederacy together. And so along the river were placed 13 batteries uh, that are guard guarding it basically as, as a vessel would turn the bend at DeSoto Point, he would be under the guns from the water battery, from Fort Hill, battery number seven, battery number six, battery number five, battery number four, they were coming into the city, Wyman's Hill battery, the Whig office battery, the depot battery, the Brooks battery, the Marine Hospital battery, the Widow Blakely battery, and then of course South Fort. This was a stretch of about four and a half miles that uh, any vessel, as they would have come around the bend, uh, is going to be under the constant bombardment from these river batteries. They were under the command of Colonel Edward Higgins. Uh, Colonel Higgins is, before the war, actually serves in the Navy for many years. Um, he entered the Confederate States Army on April 12, 1861, as a captain in the 1st Louisiana Artillery. Uh, he does supervise the construction of the defenses of Ship Island, and he was promoted to colonel on September 26, 1862, and assigned to command the Vicksburg batteries. <coughs> Railroads. Of course, the most important railroad for Vicksburg is the Southern Railroad of Mississippi. It would have stretched uh, <coughs> east to west, uh, having uh, its beginning here at Vicksburg and having its terminus uh, at Meridian. You have had the Mississippi Central Railroad. Now that's the railroad coming out of Jackson and going north towards Memphis. Uh, basically, if you had the money in the mid-19th century and you wanted to build a railroad, well then you built you a railroad. Uh, the New Orleans, Jackson, and Great Northern Railroad. And by the way, you could call it anything you wanted. So if it's coming from New Orleans to Jackson, and then why don't we throw in Great Northern just to make it sound good. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad, that's going to be this one right up here, coming out of uh, Charleston, of course, ending at Memphis, uh, having its crossroads at Corinth with the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, another vital rail line coming out of Mobile, uh, coming up to Corinth and then into Tennessee. Uh, these four railroads are the main body of transport, uh, if you will, for Confederate forces in Mississippi. You do have these little spurs that do come off uh, the one coming from Natchez to Malcolm, then from uh, Port Gibson to Grand Gulf, uh, from Port Hudson to Clinton, uh, and from Woodville down to the river as well. But the four main ones are the Southern Railroad of Mississippi, the Mississippi Central, uh, the New Orleans, uh, Jackson and Great Northern, and the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Uh, coming into Port Hudson now, Port Hudson uh, is going to, you see Vicksburg here, Port Hudson here. In Louisiana, uh, it was, uh, began as a small village. Uh, again, situated on bluffs about 80 feet above the river, not quite as high as Vicksburg's, uh, also on the east uh, side of the river, and again, also on a hairpin turn in the, in the river. It was 25 miles upriver from Baton Rouge. It was about 240, 250 river miles south of Vicksburg. When the Confederates did have control of this section of the river, it really does inhibit northern commerce. Uh, 
vessels cannot get past Vicksburg. Uh, coming down the river, of course, vessels uh, that had made it to uh, New Orleans, once they get to Port Hudson, they cannot get much past it. It is a... The Confederates do fortify this area. Again, much like Vicksburg was, constructing earthen fortifications. Um, General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, who was the commander of the Army of Mississippi, uh, wrote to a major Mansfield Lovell, uh, commander of the Lower Mississippi, in March of 1862, Beauregard recommended the fortification of Port Hudson as a measure of precaution against the fall of our defenses north of Memphis. Uh, this drawing is from the diary of Robert Knox Sneed, a uh, Union soldier. Uh, it, it does give a, a good point of reference as to where the fortifications would have been located. We'll have a better diagram here in just a minute. The initial plans for the fortifications were drawn up with the assistance of Captain James Nokate, who was chief engineer for General Breckenridge. Uh, there are three different layouts of earthworks that were considered. A central fort mounting a cannon and supported by angled outworks, a line of lunettes arranged along a 400-yard line, and a continuous ring of redoubts, trenches, and parapets surrounding the entire position. Uh, we do see a Confederate 10-inch Columbia uh, mounted in the river fortifications at Port Hudson, a photograph taken in 1863. A little bit better diagram showing the fortifications at Port Hudson. Uh, the main fortification that we see here, uh, a commissary, uh, fortification known as the bullpen, uh, and then of course these, uh, the gun positions along the river batteries. The thing that's significant about Port Hudson is that on May 27, 1863, you have the 1st and 3rd Louisiana Native Guards make an assault uh, on the defenses at Port Hudson, and this is the first real engagement that African Americans are involved in. Uh, as you, we will discuss later, uh, the Battle of Milliken's Bend on June 7, 1863 is the second uh, engagement where African Americans would have uh, fought. Then the Battle of Battery Wagner in July of 1863 uh, is the third. Of course, everybody knows the one of Battery Wagner because it is the 54th Massachusetts. And when movies with Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington are made about it, people remember it. Uh, the thing about Port Hudson, though, is it will surrender as well uh, just five days after Vicksburg surrenders. When uh, Confederate Major General uh, Gardner learns Vicksburg surrenders. He realizes there's really not much hope for himself and that basically his best option is to surrender as well. Uh, really nothing can be gained. Uh, the terms of surrender were negotiated and so uh, Port Hudson does surrender on July the 9th, 1863, uh, concluding a 48-day siege. The thing that happens with both the surrender of Vicksburg and the surrender of Port Hudson is that the trans-Mississippi states of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, uh, and Texas uh, are now separated from the main body of the Confederate states. Uh, all of the goods that are coming out of Texas, uh, beef out of Texas, uh, hogs and hominy out of Arkansas, rice, grain, and sugar out of Louisiana, men and material out of all of the states. Um, the thing to know here is, as well, uh, the guns, uh, like the Enfield rifle, that are made in Great Britain, that are being transported uh, to Matamoros, Mexico. Uh, Matamoros is a very large port of which uh, Confederates are using to try to avoid the blockade of uh, Confederate ports. 
Uh, once these goods are unloaded, it's taken across the Rio Grande into Brownsville, Texas, brought up through Texas <coughs> to uh, Shreveport, and still on wagons brought over to Monroe because the, ironically, the Shreveport to Vicksburg Railroad does not go to Shreveport. It just goes to Monroe, but from Monroe to, uh, uh, you know, to, what's the point? Delta. Uh, it's not Delta, it's Young's Point, it's uh, DeSoto. DeSoto, DeSoto Point, thank you. The little community of DeSoto where these uh, rail cars are ferried across the river reassembled in the rail yard at Vicksburg to be shipped further to the east. So once Vicksburg and Port Hudson are, are done with, all of that material no longer comes across. So it is a vital link uh, to the Confederacy that they try to hold on to Vicksburg. Uh, had they done so, perhaps the war would have uh, gone on uh, longer. That concludes my discussion on fortifications, and I will be glad to take any questions anyone might have. Yes, sir. Um, with the, uh, the batteries, like, you know, this wasn't the first time the Union had ran through naval blockade. They did it down south, they did it up north. Um, obviously, they learned the lessons. Did the South learn any lessons and change their strategy for stopping? It's a good point. Um, the there were really only a couple of the river batteries that were efficient enough at for example the uh, water battery. Uh, that is going to be right on the bend, and if you were on our uh, on Business 61, North Washington Street, and as you are uh, getting to the turn, going to the Port of Vicksburg, just before the National Cemetery, you are going to see a row of four guns right there. That is the water battery. They certainly do have a lot better angle at firing on these vessels than, say, the cannons at Fort Hill. Uh, some of these batteries uh, do have better angles than others. Uh, one of the things that uh, Admiral David Dixon Porter realizes, and it kind of goes against any type of, you know, rational thought, but let's get closer, okay? So he swings his fleet on the east side of the bank, mm -hmm. making it more difficult for these river batteries to be able to depress their muzzles and fire effectively onto these vessels. Now that being said, uh, throughout the siege you do have um, the Cincinnati, the USS Cincinnati, one of Cairo's sister ships, is sunk twice. It's also raised twice. But uh, uh, you see in reports uh, from uh, battery number seven and uh, battery number five, uh, these uh, batteries here do take claim as, as sinking that, that vessel. Do the tactics dip, change? Um, they do try to position these cannons in a little bit better location uh, in moving them from uh, one spot to another to try to get a better angle. But other than that, there's not much they can do. Uh, for one, uh, the bluffs are, are really uh, too high. But again, that will also pose a problem for uh, both Admiral Farragut and Admiral Porter because these gunboats don't have the availability to raise their muscles enough to have the effective art that they need to, to be effective at trying to dislodge these batteries. The one thing that is effective <coughs> are the mortar barges. Uh, the mortar barges that are going to be positioned just on the other side of DeSoto Point uh, and some just uh, to the south here uh, lobbing those 13-inch uh, mortar is the largest mortar. It weighs about 17,000 pounds and it's going to lob a 200-pound shell some 4,000 yards. And that's what really becomes effective. Yes, sir? You know, what kind of uh, defense did Pittsburgh have in 62 when Farragut ran the battery? 
by flowing upstream. <coughs> the, the batteries that were in place in 62 uh, do not cons constitute all of the batteries that are in place uh, for, for 63. The, you know, Farragut is here in the summer of 1862. Uh, Confederate defenses aren't really completed until October of 1862. And with that, they, that's when most of the river batteries are also completed. So they weren't all in place when Farragut is, is <coughs> making his run. Yes, sir. I want to say something real, real quick. Understand that when he's firing on these the, the, the ships that are passing by in Porter, unless his guns are very low to the water, if they're up on a hill and he's close to the to the Vicksburg bank, these are barrel loading guns. And if I depress my barrel down, what happens to the projectile? Falls out. It wants to roll forward and get a gap in between there, roll out totally. So them coming close to the east side was important in, in that sense, the idea that they couldn't fire back as easily. So it, it made a lot of difference there. The term is being under the gun. Yeah. Uh, if, if you be in close enough to a fortified position, there is a blackout area, a blind spot immediately in front that they cannot declinate the barrel enough to get you. So it was, it was, uh, it was Porter's idea to come in and get his ships under the guns, mm -hmm. meaning is close into that blind spot so that the uh, Confederate defenses would be forced to fire over them and not bring uh, direct fire to bear on the ships. You just get their smoke stack. Which, if you knock enough holes in it, it loses draft and the boilers do go out. So yeah, you don't want it. you don't want that to happen either on a, on a coal burning uh, ironclad. It is an effective way of getting stopped. <coughs> the uh, when. Porter first made the attack on the, on the 16th. Uh, the mm -hmm. initial attack when he made around the bend, he's on the west side of the river. Yes. And, and he notices that all the artillery fire that's hitting the vessels is hitting high. That's when he realizes that uh, if I go to the east side of the river, they can't compress the barrels. So that's what it does. Yes, sir. How many, did you say how many guns total were in the river battery? Uh, Total number of guns in the river batteries is 47. Uh, Confederates have 100 and, uh, excuse me, 42. They have 100 and, there's 172 cannons in the Confederate arsenal. 130 of those cannons are placed on the uh, rear line of the fence. Uh, so you have 42 cannons in place uh, in the river batteries. Uh, we actually do have those calibers and such, uh, but that's a long list. Yes, sir, Jim. Who, who constructed the Confederate fortifications primarily? Troops, slaves, mixture? Mixture. It is a mixture. The slaves are impressed in constructing these fortifications, but what soldiers are here, uh, and granted the Confederate garrison does not gain that 30,000 number until uh, early in 1863, uh, so you only have about 20,000 Confederate troops uh, in place, uh, but of course they are also working uh, to try and construct these fortifications. Uh, Major General uh, uh, Martin Luther Smith is the commanding officer in 1862 of the Vicksburg Garrison. He is the one that really initiates the construction of these defenses because he knows after Farragut has uh, come in the summer of 1862 that these defenses really need to be uh, built and built to uh, withstand a, an assault that he knows will be coming. Yes, sir. Most of these defenses, they build one shovel full of dirt at a time, or <laughs> they have better equipment than one shovel. They only had about 500 entrenching tools, either pickaxe or shovel. So it took them a while. Yes, sir. I noticed on one of the plaques it said Dahlgren gun. What is the distinction of a Dahlgren gun? A uh, Dahlgren gun is uh, actually a just the type of cannon. Mm -hmm. It is uh, named for. Uh, Admiral, Admiral Dahlgren. Yeah, I worked at the lab, research lab for six months there in Dahlgren, Virginia, but I never was told what a, 
dogmatic Civil War canon was? Is, is there some type of... Usually the quick way to recognize like is A, they're down. big, B, they have notches in the rear, uh -huh. almost like the ratchet on the, on the old uh, bumper jacks. Uh -huh. That was how you would raise or lower a dog, but it had, it, it's, its quickest recognizable feature is the notches on the back face of the gun, instead of there being a, a cascable uh, 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 there. Uh, 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 no, no uh, that's a different one. Uh, dog ribs usually, unless I'm, unless I'm confusing myself, am I confusing myself, Jake? Dog ribs, I always thought I had the notches and stuff to raise and lower. Columbiad was a different side. It may have a similar a similar elevation, stuff like that, but it's always the dog ribs. I can do We've got a hand down there of different kinds. I can, I, we can fact check that for you. There's a total of one dog in a big bird command. Total of one. One of the questions that you will get, because we get quite a bit, you notice all the terminology that uh, Will was using for the different types of fortifications, the different kinds of, of um, uh, the Abati, the Chevaux de Free, are all from what language? French. Now, people will tell you, because as Americans, all we remember about the French army is it took two weeks to surrender to the Wehrmacht in World War II. <laughs> We kind of forget that for the 400 years prior to that, remember your European history, the balance of power, the two empires that went at each other for hundreds and hundreds of years, one was the French, the other was the British. The balance of power was that France, the lilies of France, the white French infantry, were the best equipped and most technologically advanced land power on the earth for about three or 400 years. To counter that, Britain being an island, developed the Royal Navy and made that the most technologically advanced uh, ocean-going force on Earth. So it was always a matter that the English would land their army in Flanders and the French would cut them to pieces, the French would launch the lilies out onto the English Channel and the British would sink them. So when it came to these, these uh, different terms uh, for fortifications and defensive, they're all from the French because the French invented them. So you look at that question, why is this all in French? Well, since when was the French a big army? Well, about 400 years. World War I, they pretty much you know, wiped themselves out in the, in the trenches of the First World War. Um, but yes, that, uh, I've already seen the, the jokes on Facebook. I don't know if you heard this morning that with the uh, trouble going on in Ukraine, France has taken the preemptive step of su surrendering unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> So you will get the question. If we, like I say, we were in World War II, and we get that they were, in fact, the, 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 the army that everybody emulated for about 400 years. Was it was a question I saw hand up over there, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Did you tell me where the South Fork is today, and how long? Just across the street from the Shell Station on Business 61. Used to be a car wash there. there. Just, uh, just north of Navy Circle, mm -hmm. and then just up from South Fort is Louisiana Circle. Now, uh, interestingly enough, the Widow Blakely that is positioned at uh, Louisiana <laughs> Circle is serving about a mile south of where it would have originally been. Yes, sir. How wide was the river at Vicksburg at that time? Uh, half mile. The, the, you can actually, the river itself uh, is much like the river it is today, other than the fact that it, when it changed its course, coming around to Soto Point and cutting across to Soto Point. But yeah, the, the river itself is typically just like the river is today. Uh, it would have been in, in places at least a half a mile. Uh, and so it just really depends on where you are. And the Soda Point. Point. And then the Soda Point, how wide was it? The Soda Point wasn't but about a mile, mile and a half across. Okay. Actually, the city, if you look at the early buildings downtown, it was different, uh, the different the layout of the river uh -huh. relative to the town back then. And when the, the channel changed about 10 years after the Civil War, wasn't it? 1876. April 27th, 1876. Yeah. When they had uh, Grant's birthday. Grant's birthday. birthday. <laughs> we located it. 
Is land across the river at the southern unsuitable for any sort of fortification or batteries? It, it was. Uh, you're really looking at much like how you, when you cross the river today is is flat, just like the Mississippi Delta. It, it was that. It was uh, in many points swamp, uh, low-lying areas. Some of the some pieces of DeSoto Point were uh, cultivated in row crops, uh, but the majority of it was, you're just too low. You don't really have uh, much to go on other than the levee. The levee, of course, would, would be the high point. And when you reach the end of the line at DeSoto Point, the rail line, what was there? And the, the, a little town called DeSoto. And, I mean, and then they only, offloaded the goods onto what? Uh, they would have actually just been put onto ferries. The rail cars themselves are going to be pushed onto ferries, sent across the river, and at the rail yard at Vicksburg be reassembled uh, to be able to be transported further east. So it's the same gauge. Uh, this particular well, the thing about the Vicksburg uh, rail yard is you have different gauges. Even in, in the rail yard, you can substitute. Uh, but I believe that the Southern Railroad of Mississippi and uh, the Shreveport, the Vicksburg Railroad, were the same gauge. Yes? If you I, was, if, well, I was just going to say, it's a post-war image, but on the mural wall, right. there's a mural of, I think it's probably the 1880s or 1890s, showing one of those ferries. Okay. 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 That's what they're for. The train but it looks like from all the maps I've seen of the Civil War and the siege that the railroad came up to the shore and not necessarily come come right up. I mean, you did have some type of uh, a, a ferry type system that would would take these across. Um, of course, the first railroad, uh, the first bridge across. The Mississippi River is in St. Louis. Uh, James Buchanan Eads, the, the builder of the city class iron class, constructs the first bridge across the Mississippi River in 1885, 1889. Uh, so you still have, uh, you know, the concept of bringing these rail cars uh, across the river is is still a, a point of. <coughs> What's the word? In 1885, as far as we can tell, because that was pointed out, we, we did some fact checking. At that point, they were actually bringing the railroad cars and rolling them onto the ferry. The ferry was able to take them with trucks and wheels on and all onto it. They brought it across and just rolled them back off and hooked them up. Um, prior to that, the depot, the Vicksburg depot, is not on the waterfront itself. If you look at the pictures and you look at on the map, it's a couple blocks back in from uh, the river itself. It's not on the river bank, nor apparently was it at the time. It's over by the Mississippi Line region. where it is, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, in, it was yeah. back in, not quite up that far, but almost, almost that yeah. far. Um, oh. I believe it was like, what, Depot Street yeah. now, isn't it? Depot, and probably closer to Depot and Pearl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically what they were doing is, is, is taking the freight off, now, whether they actually disassembled the, the cars and brought them down, or they just took the freight and stuff off, used drayers to bring them down, bring them across on, on smaller boats, um, that we'd have to take a little more look into. But the 1885 date that's in there, from Jeff Jambrone's thing, that talks about when they actually made specific use ferries for the railroad with tracks right on the boats. There's numerous tracks on the belly of the boat that they could just push the freight cars right up onto, bring it across, and then just pull them right off the other side, hook them back up to a locomotive, and, and continue to... Uh, so they didn't carry the locomotive in 1885? I don't believe, but not again, um, I don't believe so. The main reason being is that the locomotive belongs to the railroad. And since there were two separate railroads, I don't see why the, you know, one railroad would not be sending their locomotives over onto somebody else's line. Uh, the, the, the freight, obviously, you're, plan you're, you're paying to bring the freight. Freight cars will do, but usually you'll change railroads. Um, you know, when you change uh, when you change rail line uh, companies, it would just be across the way a, Shre a Shreveport and uh, Vicksburg rail locomotive would pick the cars up and take it from there 
Conversely, on this side, a Southern Railroad locomotive will pick them up and go. Yes, sir. Well, if I'm not mistaken, after the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, when Grant's Army formed early in 63 at Young's Point and Millington's Bend, one of the first things, if I understand correctly, is they destroyed the railroad running from Richland all the way out to DeSoto Point. That's correct. And so during the siege, of course, that was of no value to them. Yeah. Uh, unless goods were brought across lower, uh, you know, like along what the Red River or um, uh, across by boats somewhere. So then they still had the interior railroad until the siege was laid or until Grant took Jackson and the railroad was destroyed. Well, that's what you will see. Uh, throughout the campaign, uh, certainly when you get later into uh, Grant's movements from Jackson uh, back towards Vicksburg, uh, they are going to do the same in regards to the railroad, uh, the tariff railroad, sections of, of railroad, uh, <coughs> telegraph lines, uh, cutting all communications and, and, and the availability of supply. So yes, the, the rail line, uh, after once Grant is in Louisiana, he is going to make sure that this rail line is not going to be a, a, an effective rail line to uh, resupply Vicksburg. Well, uh, I had a British Army officer ask me this, and I, I did not know what to say. Why didn't the river battery cannon have water? Why do they use water? Why? Well, um, that is a good question. Why do they use what? What are we talking about? Why? Why? He told me they used it in the Crimean War, so that was before this war. That was before this war. Why? Uh, I would think because the projectiles are still going to be. Uh, you have your powder charge. Uh, your then your projectile is is just loaded on on to those. Uh, some of these cannons are still going to be able to fire fixed ammunition, which means the projectile is going to be attached to a wooden sabot, sabot, and that's an advancement from the Crimean War. So that's probably why there's not like a, a wad, if you will. Uh, I think that is outdated at this point. I don't, Jake can probably speak Even to Even with the sabot on fixed ammunition, that gun's like a term, de elevated, thank you to press. I couldn't think. Uh, the weight of some of those projectiles, they don't snugly yeah. fit to the barrel like a musket ball would right. in a so rifle musket. The weight so the weight would push out the wadding in. And, and even if it doesn't fall all the way out, it may move a foot, and that's not good because that has an open gap, and that's how barrels burst. So. <coughs> Well, uh, why don't we take a, a little bit of a break, and Jake's going to be up next. And he's gonna Can I sell us out now?